Quite the night last night in Alabama, huh? The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Takeo Comfort Solutions. Glad to have you aboard. I'm reminded by the Providence Journal. I, I, in fact, I didn't even tell Lexi to put this up, but I was thinking about it coming over that uh, 10 years ago today was that uh, December debacle snowstorm, which really wasn't tremendous in terms of its snow accumulation, but was a disaster getting around. And uh, earlier today, you may have heard me, even though we record this show early in the afternoon. So I do the radio show on WPRO weekdays 3 to 6 after the show. Uh, but I've been asked today to be on Matt Allen's show at 2.30 because he's got some of the old tape of me being stuck on Route 146, screaming bloody murder and, and, and demanding that, that uh, well, jobs be terminated and I don't remember else what I perhaps was screaming about uh, as we were stuck there. And I do remember pushing cars out of downtown up the ramp, uh, the same ramp where that uh, awful shooting situation occurred now that I think about it, uh, most recently. So 10 years ago, it, it's amazing how time flies. I don't feel any different, sort of, although I don't like to push cars out of snow anymore, that is for sure. But anyway, 10 years flies by. And I think the DOT and, and the state emergency management have probably learned some things from, from that uh, situation. Anyway, uh, it's funny to mark it on your calendar. But last night was historic in its own way, don't you think? We've got... Uh, our outstanding thinker from Brown University, Professor Ehrenberg, to, uh, to work on this with us. But right now, let's just uh, take a look at what happened last night. There's a headline, of course, but here's the story from CBS. Alabama elected the state's first Democratic senator in 25 years. I think that I have been waiting all my life, and now I just don't know what the hell to say. Doug Jones squeaked to victory by about one and a half percent. Republican Roy Moore blamed his defeat on allegations of sexual misconduct with teenage girls. Part of the problem with this campaign is we've been painted in an unfavorable and unfaithful light. Moore has so far refused to concede on the hopes of a recount. Alabama's Secretary of State says he'll certify this election sometime between December 27th and January 3rd. That gives Republicans back in Washington time to pass tax reform before Doug Jones takes his seat. President Trump won Alabama by nearly 30 points, but his endorsement failed to give more the boost he needed, and even the state's other Republican senator withheld his support. I'll tell you, uh, didn't vote for him. Tennessee Republican Bob Corker said he's proud of Alabama's voters. I know that I'm supposed to only cheer for people on my side of the aisle, but uh, I thought the people of Alabama um, did a great thing for our country last night. The Alabama results bring the Senate's Republican majority to a razor thin 51 to 49 going into next year's midterm elections. That will make it even harder for President Trump to push his agenda through Congress. I especially like having Professor Ehrenberg on because he has such vast Senate experience. I mean, this is right in your wheelhouse, and it's, uh, it's great to have you. Uh, we've talked about this election uh, in, in your last visit, uh, but who thought we would have this kind of drama to the wire? Exactly. Like we did last night. If, right. it, if it is another message about how every vote counts. Absolutely. Every vote counts. Right? Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. Nice to have you. Thanks for coming. And, uh, let's just get after it. What's your, yeah. what's your gut reaction to, to what happened there? Well, uh, first of all, you know, it's, as, as everyone keeps saying, it's a very red state, one of the most Republican states in the Union. So uh, this had been percolating along for a little while, so we got a little used to the idea. But it is, it is a really... Uh, uh, important and shocking victory and there were a few things about it I think that were very important uh, the, uh, the the black vote I mean I think that this uh, uh, this uh, he would not have been elected without the uh, uh, the strong turnout across what they call the black belt down there and the Oregon, here's, and, here's a chart that uh, Eric just put up there uh, this is quite amazing, the, the differential and the substantial uh, difference between white and black in, in Alabama. 
I look. The truth of the matter is, though, the white vote uh, for the Democrat far, far exceeds what it did in 2016, uh, mm -hmm. or with Barack Obama. Yeah. Uh, so there was a there's a movement there of fed up independent white Alabaman voters. Yeah. But there's no doubt that the on the ground organization and the effort yeah. that they put in. That That's was not just a fly-by-night. That was a sophisticated job that they did to get that vote out. That's true, but if the exit polls are correct, Moore won not only the, the white vote as a whole, Big but time. the right, but the uh, college-educated white vote and white women. So uh, that's why I emphasize so much, you know, the uh, thirty percent of the electorate was were black voters. That's uh, a very strong number. I think that the uh, the the campaign's objective was something like get it to twenty five percent. Well, the population I think is low <coughs> low twenties. I think it might be close to twenty six twenty six percent the population. So they were trying to they were trying to even it. Right. They they exceeded it. Yes. Uh, what does that tell us about our politics? It's a tale of two Alabamas. Yeah. No, that's right. And I think... Uh, it's a good or bad. Well, to the extent that our, uh, our, our national politics are so badly uh, divided, polarized along partisan terms, I think is a problem. Having said that, I think this election uh, was very because of the issues that uh, came to the fore. I think was very inspirational to people. I think this was uh, nationally. This is a victory for the uh, Me Too movement, for example. Uh, right. It's complicated. It's very complicated. The race was complicated. The analysis is complicated. There's so many aspects to the legitimacy of the stories on Roy Moore, his handling of the situation, uh, looking deeper into the kind of candidate he, he is anyway. Alabama, uh, people from Alabama and media types kept saying over the last week or so, listen, this whole sexual predator thing that hangs over him right now, aside, we know this guy. You know, he's been run out twice. Yes. We know this guy. <laughs> uh, he's like a worn shoe yeah. in that state. Yeah. Right? That's right. That's right. N and not an especially popular shoe, by the way. Well, so that. So for a guy that's, who's even not a his popular last shoe, the, hit, it's a pretty good performance on. Yeah, is, well, it's. Right? It think speaks, up, think it, about it. You, got, you know what it is? Uh, Rich and I are just kind of stuttering right now because <laughs> because it's a stuttering yeah, story. Yeah, it really I, is. I mean, it it, it, it does. It, and and the uh, I think Roy Moore's showing speaks to just how strong the partisan tribalism is right now. In that, uh, uh, you know, th there were there there were many voters who were actually articulating the idea that they'd rather vote for a pedophile than vote for a Democrat. That's pretty strong stuff. But and yet, a lot of them were suggesting that the 40-year gap gave them enough room to be able to suggest yeah. that the stories may it, not have held up. Was it the 40-year gap that gave them room or was it Donald Trump? I don't know. You tell me. Well, I think a lot of the headroom was created by Trump because he came in there. He so strongly backed Moore. He, uh, you know, he, he, he provides the built-in example of someone who's been accused in his own right and kind of survived that and has uh, maintained that since an election interceded, that now that's been litigated and he doesn't need to answer for it anymore. And that's where uh, uh, Moore was wanting to go. That's what we would have he heard if Moore won. You know, there would have been an ethics investigation in the Senate, 
But the Moore side would have been saying, look, the people of uh, Alabama elected me, and they, they, all these allegations were on the table. They've been litigated. It's in the past. Right. So when we come back, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, because uh, the professor's expertise, amongst other things, is the Senate itself, what the Senate could have done, uh, how relieved the Senate probably is not to have to do what it might have had to do, uh, and whether or not this victory is actually long-lasting. It might be a short stint for the Democrats. Stay with us. Roy Moore, oh, some of the complainants and uh, his lawyers and complainants. I thought we had uh, some Doug Jones video in there as well. Anyway, there's the uh, the yearbook. All that stuff goes by the wayside now. Nobody's yes. gonna, no that's one's gonna right. litigate that stuff anymore. No, that's right. They, everybody, everybody goes to their corners and lives for another day of arguing, right? Uh, that's right. But when it comes to when it comes to Doug Jones and his victory. Uh, interesting that he said he's been waiting for this his entire life. Uh, professional politics is an interesting game. I've never mm -hmm. complained about professional politics because I think it's a worthy, it's a worthy endeavor. I think America, though, hates professional politics mm -hmm. for some reason. I, I don't think we have a very sophisticated view of politics amongst the rank and file of America. Do you agree? I do. I, I, I think that's. I think it's mostly because our politicians have been running against it for so long. I mean. Running against professional politics? Yeah, everybody runs against Washington. Right. I'm not a politician. I'm not, yeah. well, you're running. I'm different. You're a I'm different. Send me down there and I'll clean up that mess. You hear that over and over and over again. Right. So that has resonated. And so we resent people who've always wanted to be a United States senator. I think a, you know, a seven year old kid who, who tells you, rather than being a firefighter or you know, a teacher, I, I'd like to be a U.S. senator. Will be looked upon as some kind of some, like somebody's got to be you know put into some kind of therapy for heaven's sake. Well, you know this uh, has been uh, true for m most of American history, that that members of Congress have been held in relatively low esteem, in general. However, in their own districts, in their own states, they're held in much higher esteem. Right. So we think of our senators, for the most part. We think of our senators as, uh, 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 you know, important people to be respected and admired, and who have done a lot for our state. It's a psychological disorder <laughs> in yes. America that the place that we send our esteemed representatives to is a dump, is a swamp. Right. Uh, now, look. Clearly, people feel disenfranchised. It's they don't not, feel like by they've the been way. super served. But it's not a swamp. It's most assert, ass, assertedly not. Uh, no, is it biased it, because you worked in the trenches no, in the Senate it's for a lot of your career? No, it, it's because I, 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 I'll, let's leave congressional staff out of it. Let's leave Capitol Hill out of it. I'll say this. You know, much of what we complain about when we complain about the swamp is the, the bureaucracy. That's almost a dirty word. And yet, my experience for 34 years in Washington was that federal employees across the various departments overwhelmingly are uh, talented, professional, patriotic, uh, uh, hardworking individuals. And I think more often than not, it saves us. It allows the government to kind of go along and function while we have all kinds of absurd things happening on the political level, a bunch above the uh, above the bureaucracy. Speaking of the politics, so if Roy Moore had won, do you believe really that there would have been a full-scale ethics investigation into him? I do, I do. I, I I predicted the last time we were together that he would be expelled. Uh, I tend to believe that that would have happened. Now I know a lot of other. Uh, pundits have looked at it and said, no way, you know. Uh, but I was there for the Packwood hearings, and I remember what it's like. That went on for a couple of years. And I remember what it's God, like. It would have been that, ugly. It would have been yeah, so awful. awful. Women coming in to testify, testify denials, absolutely. you know, penmanship and yearbook analysis, oh, yeah. forensics. And the, and the effort to tear the women down and all that kind of uh, uh, vicious strategy. 
that takes place. It's clear that establishment Republicans, again, a dirty term, at least the, the president is, is trying to create uh, that reality, mm -hmm. meaning it's a dirty term, yes. are completely relieved. Mm -hmm. Completely oh, relieved. Democrats yeah. are happy they got one on their team. Republicans are thinking oh, yeah. we could spare the seat because oh, yeah. our brand a, would have been ruined. This was a nightmare for McConnell. I mean, he doesn't want to lose another seat out of his caucus, but I think uh, in his heart of hearts, he certainly did not want more in his caucus. Did he thread the with needle? Everything that that would have did, meant. Did he thread the needle well? I thought he balked. You know, it was more or less, we don't want this guy in, and then all of a sudden we'll let the people decide. Uh, the NRC, the, the RNC he, came in with some financial help. It all was part of the Trumpian uh, support Yeah, but the Senate campaign committee never did. Correct. And so, at least as far as the Bannon people and all of that, they're going to be after McConnell again with a, uh, uh, a vengeance. Right. So, so... So because they, a will, bad guy either they way. will say that Moore lost because the establishment didn't support him enough, the right. Washington establishment. Right. It is, it is uncannily common ground, the disposition of the President of the United States and Steve Bannon. Nothing is on them. Nothing is right. their fault. Let's look at the tweets real quick that yeah. the President put right. out on the election first. Right. Um, uh, you know, last night on, on, on the bottom, not so bad. Yeah. Congratulations to Doug Jones, hard fought victory. The right in votes played a very, very factor, but a win to win. People in Alabama are great. Republicans will have a shot at the seat in a very short period of time. It never ends. Um, of course, he had to say something. The right in votes played a big factor. Well, not, you know. Yeah, but after he had his night's sleep and he got up in the morning, he was, he right. was ready to go. The reason I originally endorsed Luther Strange, who lost in the primary to Roy Moore, is that I said Roy Moore will not be able to win the general election. I was right. He worked hard, but the deck was stacked against him. Uh, yeah, incredible. <laughs> Just, we've been constantly asking whether the American people will finally kind of get who this president is. I think they do. Even his supporters have to look at that and say, yeah. man, this guy just can't ever make, he yeah. can't get real ever, ever, ever. I think we get misled by how, how solid his base is because it's down around 32, 33 percent in most of the polls now. But I think what goes That's on. That's the core. What goes, yes. And they, they'll stick with him. They'll believe whatever he says. If he says it's fake news, it's fake news, whatever it is. Uh, it could go down at the edges. It could go down a little bit further. But what he's lost over the course of this year increasingly is the ability to rise from that. Right. The well, other 66 percent is digging in much more aggressively against him. You got a quick note from a student. Let's put, that, let's, let's put this up. I think this is, we've got to move quickly here, but uh, if you've if you got a, Eric, you can pop some of it up. Well, it's rather lengthy. Watching the results come in tonight using and, and seeing the hope on my grandfather's face reminded me why I want to study American politics. It reaffirmed the integral American values of participation, democracy, and equality that you stress so much in class. A lot of times in politics, especially in recent years with the intensity of polarization, it's hard to find the American exceptionalism we learn about in class upheld in practice tonight was the first time in a long time. Um, and it was exciting down to the wire besides, yeah, right? Yeah. Give, give me a short reflection on that. Yeah. Well, I found this, I found it, I brought this note along because I found it very inspiring. I mean, here's a young political science student in my uh, uh, introduction to uh, American political process. And in those lectures, inevitably, I have to say, here's how the process works. This is, you know, this is the way it's supposed to happen. Now let's talk about why it's so dysfunctional now. And, you know, the, 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 the notion was that yesterday's victory in Alabama uh, was a, an injection of real hope for uh, some young people that haven't seen a lot to be hopeful about. Mm, interesting. Let's see. I, I wonder what the professor thinks is Doug Jones' um, projected time spent in Washington. It may be short-lived. We'll talk about it next. So there he is, Doug Jones, real quick, Professor. Let's hit a couple bases real, as fast as we can. The uh, 
the term is through 20, the 2020 election. That's right. Um, he's going to have some needles to thread himself in terms of just how he votes policy for a very conservative state. Absolutely. Roy Moore mucks it up, but he's going to have to vote pretty moderate conservatively in order to retain that seat, correct? Yes, I think so. You think it's a two-year uh, flyby? Uh, well, there's always a lot of opportunity for an incumbent senator to... Uh, Didn't happen uh, in Mass. Elizabeth Warren is in no, there. No, that's right. That's absolutely right. right? So yeah. uh, anybody, anybody can guess uh, on this situation. That's right. That's uh, right. It's going to be, no doubt it's going to be an uphill struggle. Timing for issues for Doug Jones, uh, certification, and all that kind of thing uh, has to be done by mid-January. can't start until right after Christmas. Who knows if this recount thing will hang on. It seems to be a useless yeah. cause. Well, it, it, in terms of his being seated, uh, there was no way they were going to seat him uh, before the first of the year anyway. So the tax cut plan? Because they want to get the tax cut bill through. Think it will? Uh, yeah, I think they, they have an agreement in principle today. And, uh, I, you know, so I think they're going to come out of conference committee and they're going to swallow a hod. It's going to be a very unpopular tax bill. Uh, but they're going to, you know, they're, they're going to uh, claim it's the best thing since sliced bread. This makes 2018 really fascinating. It does. Because? Well, because it, people won't be happy with the tax plan. Democrats will be on a roll from Alabama, all that. That's right. That's right. And I think uh, Republicans will be on the defensive. Uh, because because of the the uh, the uh, history that we've seen of the Trump administration, you just wrote something uh, for publication. Where did this appear? This is in Newsmax. Newsmax, uh, yeah. But you, yeah, you only have thirty seconds. Okay, we'll do another show on it. All right. You think we've missed everything? That the federal judgeship situation that Trump has employed is a long-term thing Absolutely. for America. Absolutely, these are lifetime appointments. There's a not just right, the Supreme Court. Right. Right now, there's a hundred and forty-four vacancies. And he will fill all those. And because of the rules changes that have taken place in the Senate, uh, the Republican majority are going to be able to crank those through on a fast track. Democrats actually the blew face. their own big toe off, didn't they? They did. Yeah. It's fascinating. They did. That requires a little bit more analysis. Historic day, huh? Yeah. You'll have it something sure to talk is. about with the kids, that's for sure. Yeah. That's right. You never thought you'd see all this, did you? Yeah. No, that's right. I don't think anybody it's, it's a surprising day. Appreciate you coming in. Thanks, my pleasure. Uh, final word when we come back. Absolutely fascinating result. I think uh, it'll be interesting to see how Southern New England actually re reacts on, on the radio and the like. And look, the conversation I think is kind of interesting is this career politician thing and this dichotomy between, uh, as the professor was talking about, the idea that we love our, we love our, our locally federally elected legislator, whether it be congressperson, rep, or senator, um, and we think this place is a dump in Washington. Yeah. That is, it's dysfunctional. It's not helping us, and we need to think that through. Uh, see you on the radio tomorrow at 3. Coming up on the Thursday television program, the opioid crisis, correct, Lexi? The opioid crisis uh, and the fire stations becoming a place where you can get some aid. It's a really compelling new program in the city of Providence and in Rhode Island. So stay tuned for that tomorrow night. Good night.